Okay, James chapter 2, 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Wow. Okay, so this passage is one that has um, always been kind of misunderstood at times. And, you know, we begin to go, well, James was fighting against Paul. And Paul says it's faith alone. And, and James comes along and says, no, it's not faith alone. It's faith and works. And, and so then you have individuals that are in more of a Reformed or Calvinistic where, um, you know, you, you hear the underlining of you work for your salvation, even more so in like Gnostic Gospels. Um, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, right? That's why they um, go out and are missionaries for a period of time because they have to work to gain their salvation. And so how do we reconcile the whole of Scripture? Paul, who says it's faith alone, and James, who's going, yeah, you say it's faith alone, and I say that's hogwash. So let's understand this. They both believe the same thing. You are saved by faith alone. Nothing else. In fact, we'll, we'll talk in a minute about saved by grace alone, in faith alone, or by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So they both agree with that. But James is going on with this group of people who said, you know what? I, I have hell insurance now. That's all I needed. I believe that's all I needed. Who cares about anything else? Good morning, Ray. And, and so James is going, no, 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 no. You're saved by faith alone. But that faith ought to cause you to want to do something. That faith ought to want to cause you to, to praise and to worship and to serve the one true God. The one who gave you this grace, this amazing grace. So Love of God and creation and of others leads us to acts of compassion. The more you love God, the more you love others and you want to do something for them. James told us, faith cannot exist in conjunction with partiality. And now it cannot exist without works or actions because it will change us. The grace of God is going to change you to work something inside of you, right? We've talked about it in church, to change you um, inside from the inside so that you're made different outside and corporately, right? You know, the inward disciplines to make a change outward and corporately. That's what God does in our lives. That's that journey of sanctification. Getting saved, asking God into your heart, well, that's just a beginning step. But so often, if not intentional, we get caught there. We stop there. We quit growing. And James goes, no, no, no. If you're truly captured by the grace of God, you're going to grow. And that growing is going to change you. We are saved by, the word is solofida. 
by faith alone, sola alone, fide, faith, faith alone, it's Latin, in, in Christ alone, solo Christus, solo Christus. So you have faith alone and Christ alone. Remember, I, I had said it a second ago, this this whole, uh, in, in the Wesleyan background and um, in other churches, we would say the same thing. You are, it is solo gratia, solo fide, solo Christus. You are saved by grace alone, grace of God alone, nothing you've done, by faith alone, by Christ alone. That's it. But now what? And that's where James comes in saying, works alone don't save you. But faith alone doesn't give us an excuse to sit in the pew and do nothing. James pulls out the argument of belief. Even demons believe and, and that God is real and they believe in Christ alone and yet they shudder at it. They don't that faith and that belief doesn't cause them to do something, to believe it so much that it changes them. They believe it and so they're fighting against it. They believe in Christ alone and they shudder. It doesn't change them by itself. Belief in itself doesn't change us. The confession of faith doesn't save us to the uttermost. We must love the Lord your God with all your heart. Deuteronomy 6, 5 and 6. That heart, that's the seat of emotions, the seat of passion. I read a quote just this morning, something on Billy Graham, and I, I couldn't quote it for you because uh, it didn't even connect till right now, but you know, he he makes this comment about how your emotions can pull you away, and you need to keep your emotions under control with God, right? That's that orthopathy, right? Orthodoxy, right belief, orthopraxy, the right actions, and orthopathy, the right emotions, keeping your emotions under the control of God. So faith without works, it, it, well, it keeps us isolated. It keeps us from being, being present uh, among the hurting. After all, it's safer that way, right? It makes life like one big cruise ship. We would rather be on a cruise ship getting served than we would like to be on a battleship at war, the spiritual warfare against the enemy. On a cruise ship, there's no dirty, there's no messy, there's no hurting people. But even Abraham's faith caused him to do something. Faith is perfected by our works. Faith is grown to sanctification by our works. Faith calls us to realize our sins and want a way out. Works produced by faith causes us to do whatever needs to be done to grow, to become more like Christ. Whatever it takes, we're going to do it. To cut out the sin in our lives that so easily entangles us and allow faith to grow. To describe this, James uses two people. First, he talked about the patriarch Abraham. We talked about that kind of a second ago. And, and then on the other end of the spectrum, right? They were all children of Abraham. They idolized Abraham. On the other end of the spectrum, he pulls out this prostitute, Rahab. She was dirty. She was messy. She was all the above. She was a Gentile. I mean, come on. And yet, her faith, she says, you know, we all believe that you're in your God and we've seen what he does. You are do. You are going to get this city. And that faith caused her to do some work. She hid the spies. She helped free the spies. That's what God does in our life. Rahab received the same grace through her faith and her works as Abraham, their patriarch. You know, our relationship with God is a matter of practice. It's obeying God's will, actively seeking him to listen and to follow the community of God in our lives, the commands of God. Faith is not a private 
grouping of all of my individual views. It's not me taking my favorite verses and only watching those, right? I mean, I said it yesterday in, in our service that if I had my way, I'd probably only read the Gospels and maybe John the most, right? I love John and, um, you know, Luke's pretty good too, but John's really like my favorite one. He makes Jesus really human, right? You know, and you see the humanity of God and um, the realness of God who became man. And I love John and I love James. So maybe I'd only read those two books. Ignore the rest of scripture. And that's not what we're called to. We don't throw out the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. We don't throw out the book of Numbers just because we don't like it or the book of Leviticus because it's just a bunch of rules. We, we don't throw out passages, and, and you know, but we so often do that. We take one verse and we say, oh, that must mean this. And yet we don't read the context of the verse to know what it really means. We do isogesis, right? We read it in light of how I want it to read. You know, I said it yesterday, and I get in trouble probably for it, but we read things like Revelations, and we read it more in light of our current events and newspaper than we do read the scriptures, and then when we look at the newspaper, we interpret it in light of the scriptures. Scriptures always should be our basis for understanding what's going on. Why do the nations rage? Why do they plot and scheme, the psalmist said. They're foolish attacks. Well, because when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, hold on, it's not time yet. Jesus said that. Oh, but we, we, we've we misquoted that so many times of when you see rumors, hear of rumors of wars, look to the heavens. That's not, no, that's not the verse. It wasn't the context. We misquote things. God won't give you anything more than you can bear. Well, you can't bear anything. As Paul says, in my weakness, if he is made stronger, that I will glory in my weakness. I will boast in my weaknesses. We must have a full scripture understanding of God's commands. You don't get that if you don't get into God's word and grow and learn. We have to grow, to serve, to give, to go, to gather to fellowship. You know, so many uh, are, are ignoring the gathering and fellowshipping. And I'm not talking those who just can't get into a church right now. I'm talking those who could and just don't want to. I'm talking those who got comfortable um, watching from their couch with their pajamas when they do watch. Turn it on like noise and go around their day doing other stuff. We're called to gather together, to grow together, not just in a Sunday school group. That was just a part of it. No, we were called to gather in the synagogues, in the temples. The early church didn't forsake that even when they were being persecuted. They would go into the synagogues. We are called to be in the large groups, the small groups, and the one-on-one -on -one groups. You can't do this alone. You can't grow alone. You can't do this with only like-minded people who think and look only like you. You get a one-sided gospel when we do that. We're called not to a cheap grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a, an amazing book. I was going to grab it to show you, and uh, I realized I've given it out again. Um, I, I give it out all the time. So I've replaced it numerous times, but it's called uh, The Cost of Discipleship. Um, uh, the Cost of Discipleship is a beautiful book. Now, Dietrich Hon uh, Bonhoeffer sometimes is like really out there. Um, you know, he was a, uh, um, during World War II, he saw the German church who stood by the wayside as Hitler took over. Um, People who don't understand that history tried to equate that at the beginning of the pandemic to churches that did close their doors for a little while, that we were giving in just like the German church. And it's like, you don't, you know, totally, totally different, totally different. But here's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer has to say about cheap grace. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross 
grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy, which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ, at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to, calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. You were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. We can believe but so did the demons, and they shudder. But that belief doesn't cause them to change the way they live. We can say a prayer and ask God into our heart and think we have hell insurance. But slowly we'll fade away. You know, I think a lot of what we are seeing in the church today is the winnowing fork, the wheat and the chaff. The chaff have been blown away and are not attending churches anymore. And, and I don't mean, I don't mean to sound horrible and if that's you, I apologize. But it's become easier to get worried, fearful, anxious, to find excuses. You know, I'm, I'm a bit of an introvert. I love being alone. I get my strength from being alone. But I can't always put my strength and my emotions first. There are some weekends that require too much in order to minister. And that's okay, because he gives strength to the weary. You know, we are called to gather, to encourage one another. We need each other. We need to learn to grow, to understand that faith without works, is dead. That we weren't called just to believe and sit in a pew. Now, that doesn't mean we all become missionaries. It doesn't mean that we all have to quit our jobs. And not. I, I've had people tell me that. And that's No, that's not what God would call you to do, right? You know, we are called to be the light of Christ everywhere we go. Is he changing you inwardly so that he can change you outwardly and corporately so that all will see the light of the world shining through you bright? The works are simple. The works aren't missionary acts. The works are being a friendly face at work, not getting caught up into the gossip. Being a witness and telling somebody you'll pray for them. There are multiple ways that we get to be the light, the hands and the feet for Jesus Christ, that our works come out. If you truly believe in Jesus Christ, you can't help 
and invite people to come and see. It can be as simple as just handing a postcard. Maybe you're an introvert, and so you take a postcard for a Christmas Eve service and hand it to them. Say, hey, I'd love to see you there. I'll save you a seat. I don't know what it is God's calling you to do. We need to grow. We need to be challenged. So Heavenly Father, I come before you and God, I thank you that we are saved by grace. Grace alone. Which causes us to believe, to have faith alone in you. And it only happens because of the work of your son coming, walking this earth, and dying for us. So thank you, God, for that. Lord, may our faith grow. May we learn to devour the word of God, devoured, hagar, hagar, which was the Hebrew word to meditate, to devour, which gave this the, gave the image and the picture, the audible picture of a lion devouring its prey. May we devour the word of God each and every day. May we not get enough. Heavenly Father, we need you each and every day. Grow us, make us more like your son. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, go in peace. And I pray you have a great rest of the day. Good morning, Chris.